Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 870. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 16th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. It's going to be a big show, lots of stories. The world has changed upside down in just a matter of days since we've last recorded. And you get to follow that here on Unscripted. If you've not done so lately, please click the like button either on Facebook or YouTube. That promotes this show. It gives uh, YouTube and Facebook a false sense of security that we're safe to promote. Just click that like button. If you've not done so lately, please share this uh, episode with family, friends, and foe. The the way this grows is by word of mouth. Uh, We're closely, closely, slowly coming up on 10,000 subscribers after, you know, like 1,500 years of work. Uh, Why is it so slow for this show to grow? Uh, First of all, it's it's an ecleptic small market of Anglican news. And... uh, We've been on one of the original Christian programs on YouTube for a long time, and they don't like to promote Christian programs. So this is very slow to uh, organically uh, grow. It is what it is. Please go to the comments. Yeah. And also, we're uh, an hour-long show, and uh, that uh, long format is unusual. Most Mm -hmm. uh, shows are eight, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And so being an, an hour... Uh, actually, and people watching it actually speaks to the investment people want to make in uh, these issues that we discuss, mm-hmm. rather than a sort of quick in and out. Um, and in a great transition here, that means you go to the comment section. You're invested in this. We're invested in this. We want to know what you think. We don't want you just to sit down here and be entertained and be informed. But we're interested in what you think. There's an audience uh, for each episode of about 4,000 people. Go in there and make 4,000 comments. Make George and I proud. Uh, let's move on to how we're doing. George, how are you doing? I'm doing great. But I got to tell you that there was a paradigm shift, a culture shift. Something happened on Saturday evening here in mm-hmm. the United States that has changed the culture at least three days out now the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Sunday morning, uh, I I preached Saturday night, normal sermon. Sunday, then we had, as I was coming out of the service, I uh, saw the news uh, come across my uh, screen in the car. Susan and I went to Sonny's Barbecue, which is a high cuisine for our area. It's one of these places where like 10 TVs on the wall, nine Mm -hmm. of them are sports and one of them is, uh, is, is Fox. And all the channels were turned to the news channels, and everybody in that place was speaking and talking about the assassination attempt. And I was still dressed from work. I didn't have my cassock on, but I was dressed like this. And people from other tables would come up to me and ask me, was God's hand at work in this? Sunday morning, we had our Bible study, and I was going to talk about Caitlin Clark and her uh, (laughs) triple-triple. (laughs) Triple-triple. using the theme of, of, you know, from Hebrews, running the race until it's complete. Mm -hmm. Well, that lasted two minutes, and we had an hour's discussion of how God is at work in our lives, driven by people asking questions, was God's hand at work in Mm -hmm. saving Donald Trump? So... National politics has broken into the conscience of the average American. Really, now you and I, Kevin, are politically attuned. We follow stuff, and this may not be as earth-changing for us as it is for many people. But for most Americans, they polit- national politics is not on their radar. Uh, in a, in a, in the way it is for uh, I guess those who watch our show and for you and me. Yeah. But it's well, now there. I, most people have finally grown weary of politics. Uh, in in this age of social media, in this age of 24-7 news, people have just been, you know, exasperated and sigh when they hear something new. And um, because they don't know if it's true. First of all, nobody knows if it's true when they hear something in the news anymore. There's no way to verify it. There's no way to um, go to a different news source to, to find out if it's true or not. And that makes this nation and this world very worried. Um, They're tired of it. They're sick and tired of politics. 
And this event that happened in Pennsylvania uh, certainly awoken a consciousness because all of a sudden, people of a certain age, 60 plus, think JFK. Uh, everybody uh, my age and your age think uh, Lincoln and JFK. Anybody w of a certain education or branch in history and um, social uh, paradigms think uh, of all the assassination attempts that have happened over time and assassinations. And th there's this wake-up call that, what happened? Uh, well, I, I, I was tired of politics. Now I can't, I can't turn off the TV. I want to know what happened to Donald Trump. I want to know what's happening. Uh, who, who's in charge? Remember when Reagan was shot and he was rushed to the hospital? A, a famous uh, uh, person from the the, uh, the Alexander Hague <laughs> got in front of the mic. Don't worry, I everything's under control. I'm in charge. <laughs> and but people want to know what's going on. Who's in charge? Yeah. I I remember as a very small child the summer of '68. And I remember Robert Kennedy's assassination mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And I, rem and I remember my father, who was in the Pennsylvania National Guard at the time, was mobilized. The only time he was ever mobilized for after six years in the Guard. And he was, uh, his, uh, he was in the Philadelphia City Troop Cavalry. He was a horse soldier. Oh, wow. And he, was, his, he and his, uh, his uh, regiment were mobilized and sent to Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, on horseback to basically combat quell. crowds. Yeah, quell the crowd. Uh, quell, quell riots. Mm -hmm. Now, Philadelphia didn't have riots because we had a mayor at that time, Frank Rizzo, who was uh, a bit of a uh, comic uh, tough guy. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't Chicago or some other places. But for me, the assassination attempt brought back those sort of visceral feelings of social unrest and fear. You know, daddy's going to war and really wasn't war because I remember my mother and I drove down with my brothers in the station wagon, brought dad lunch uh, in a bag, <laughs> in a bag all, because, you know, army food wasn't that good, but it could have been that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. God's hand, some people say, uh, deflected the bullet. But then when people say that, what do you say to the family of the fire chief who was killed in the background? Mm -hmm. The, you know, if God was involved, why did God save Donald Trump and not save this fireman? Or JFK or Lincoln. I mean, uh, you go through uh, American politics, go through any nation's politics. Why wasn't God saving this famous and, politician? And last week was the 80th anniversary of another assassination attempt, the, the bomb plot to kill Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Why was Hitler Spared. always saved? Yeah. He had, he survived. I don't know, I mean, a dozen plus that we know of assassination yeah. attempts. and Four some direct of them just, and, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, so I've been reading a lot, and uh, there was an opinion piece in the New York Times, which I actually agreed with, probably the first time in a long time, that said, while people may be talking about this as a God thing, uh, perhaps, perhaps not, but they're saying this is a Hegel thing, that Donald Trump is a man of destiny like Napoleon or Alexander the Great or Caesar and with the uh, and you don't judge him by his character or what he says by his actions mm -hmm. and he basically is something he's the representative of the absolute uh, using Hegel's terms mm -hmm. and he's a test for our society of how we react to him is he no. a form of chastisement Oh, it's exposure of our weakness or decay, or is he a pillar of our strength? But that's exactly In other words, he's almost, yeah. he's almost a, a totem that we respond to. Mm -hmm. So there is no real Donald Trump anymore. Who, There's just you, who you are as a person was revealed in how you responded to the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Whether you said, oh, Lord, our nation needs prayer, or whether you say, well, oh, my gosh, they need to try again that revealed who you are as a person. And mm -hmm. now, in my contextualization, this was the moment of places like Twitter. Um, because I was watching video from the event moments later, 
being posted on Twitter, not being filtered through CNN, who thought that Trump had stumbled when he heard loud shot, uh, loud noises, not through NBC, who thought that uh, he scratched a pimple off his ear, not through uh, you know all the the American news cycle or the BBC. Uh, I got to see unfiltered news being uploaded to X.com or Twitter.com. And I could decide for myself what was real, what was not real, um, which is going to be Elon Musk's greatest favor to uh, journalism, is to, to allow freedom of speech and something that is completely unfiltered. And uh, I was fully informed uh, by the events of that day, moments after it happened, you know. Nobody had to tell me that uh, he he stumbled trying to get his shoes tied. That did not happen. <laughs> so, oh, George. Um, it, now well, it's a different it, age. It, because let's go back and answer that question. Is God involved in any way, shape, or form with uh, the life and death and assassination of politics? That's a good question. I mean, because, you know, God is in charge of all. Mm -hmm. How? Why? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get into discussion of predestination or anything. <laughs> no, I know. I'm not a Calvinist in any way, shape, or form. However, you know, the, we often ask this question looking back in history, and this is now a, a part of history, where was God in this? Mm -hmm. And we may not know for centuries. Uh, we know, looking back, uh, where God was at the Civil War, we know where God was in all these different realms of time looking back, but we never knew at the time where he was. So. And I think the better question to ask is, where is God in Donald Trump's heart at this point? Whether or not we think God intervened in Donald Trump's life right now, hmm. last Saturday, is immaterial. I think it's what Donald Trump thinks that matters at the most, because will this be a, for him, a wake up call? Uh, will this just uh, be burnished an already very powerful ego? Or will this uh, bring in a, uh, a strong dose of humility that, you know, I could be, I should be dead. Mm -hmm. That if I hadn't turned my head unexpectedly to look at a jumbotron, I would be dead. Um, so how is God going to use this in Donald Trump's life is I think for me, the, the biggest takeaway. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I, 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 I would pray that he would find humility in this and that he would discover a closer walk with God in this. Uh, that would be my prayer in all of this, that boy, you have a second chance uh, not to be, not to live your ultimate life, uh, but to be a follower of the living God. And, uh, you know, now, there, there were a lot of church reactions. Um, I have to say this, and this will annoy several people. Michael Curry was the first off the boat, and this has been the best so far. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Curry, you know, we may joke about him as being shallow and this and that. He wrote a very powerful message addressing Donald Trump directly. Steve Woods, the new Archbishop of Acna, was a disappointment. He just reprinted a prayer from the prayer book and didn't even mention Donald Trump by name. This could be trotted out, you know, at a, at a, at any crisis. Uh, you, Steve Woods wasn't well served by his staff. The Vatican has been under tremendous criticism for putting out a statement in Italian, not even in English, mm -hmm. lamenting the attack, but not mentioning Donald Trump's name. It's been called mean spirited by not uh, mentioning Donald Trump's name. And then Justin Welby had a statement uh, the next morning that was, you know, it didn't really say anything. It was fairly confused. Um, so I have no surprises there. But some, some organizations passed the test that you wouldn't expect, and some failed it. Um, well, there it is. Well, there it is. So the hate mail can commence. <laughs> well, no, but he, no, absolutely. Do not send hate mail because people did the right thing and people don't know how to respond to an assassination. This is so infrequent in our history. Thank God. You know, the, this democracy has served us well enough that uh, it takes a real uh, bent person, a deranged person to 
pick up a gun, put a bullet in it, and aim it at a, a political opponent. And, you know, it doesn't happen that uh, frequently here. And this is not uh, some countries in Africa or some countries in Asia uh, 40 years ago or some countries, you know, it, this is this is America who is sur still surviving this capitalist uh, um, democracy republic experiment. It's hard to survive, but um, I'm okay with people not knowing how to respond to an assassination attempt because it doesn't happen that often. Um, yeah. For me, I, I feel very badly for the family, the parents of this kid. Yeah. Father, um, father, parents of, yeah, the, absolutely. The, yeah. I, I know it's not a popular thing to say, but here we had a unhappy, dysfunctional well, loser kid, as his friends, as his classmates described it. And he, somehow or another, he was so radicalized that he engaged almost in a suicide mission. Um, if Christ were only in this young boy's life, what a change it would have made. Mm -hmm. It basically speaks to the work we need to do among young people to we, you know, the radicalization is out there that they can go onto TikTok, they can go onto these reels and be so corrupted by the evil that's being peddled. It just, you know, our job, our enemies are not communists or socialists or things of this nature. It's the satanic that is mm -hmm. out there that is leading young boys you know a, a geeky small kid taking his father's hunting gun and trying to kill the president um i just feel you know where was god in that boy's life yeah. why what was was he failed by the church um, well yeah i mean our biggest enemy and we always forget this is the spirit of the age is mm -hmm. what's happening here now in, in a spiritual realm. We always think of uh, politics as being very face and stuff like that. We're, we're dealing with spiritual battles here. Uh, I know this because we've come, we become a country that is okay with cutting off the genitals of the children if they're confused about their gender or aborting unwanted uh, babies because we want to have sexual freedom. I know that there's a spiritual battle going on. I know that this hurts the very heart of the Father. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Satan can't kill God, but he can certainly wipe out uh, millions of babies and uh, um, you know, convince people they don't need their genitalia. Yeah. Good. Ge yeah. <laughs> well, Satan has entered the medical world very well uh, in a very evil way. But um, so what happens from here? Uh, politics has changed overnight. Uh, Twitter has changed overnight. People who used to hate Donald Trump now see him as a hero. People who used to loathe Donald Trump still loathe him. Uh, this will change and iconicize Donald Trump, but will it get him elected? Don't know. Oh, I have no doubt about that. Yeah. There's a million things can happen in politics. Sure. But if the election were today, yes, uh, he would win... <clears throat> He would win a Reagan era landslide mm -hmm. uh, because what we have is people who were sort of shy about saying they supported Trump. Now they've already decided in their heads ahead of time, but now they've made the public affirmation that they support Donald Trump. Um, you, and you're I, seeing, you know, Trump. Trump uh, one poll I saw shows that Trump almost has a majority of Af if black mm -hmm. male support. Just imagine that. Uh, there were some videos I was paging through on Facebook of some black comedians. And one of them, uh, you know, a young black man before in a black audience in Detroit or someplace saying, you know, that uh, I can't use the language he used because of uh, censorship. You're white. <laughs> yeah, I'm white. But uh, yeah. Donald Trump is, you know, He's been arrested and he's been shot at. And the joke was, yeah, this, this is not my, this isn't the president. This is my uncle Leroy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sense that uh, he is, for some uh, historically disadvantaged and oppressed people, they now have a great deal of empathy for Donald Trump because even though he's a billionaire, mm -hmm. he was born with great riches and wealth and this and that, they empathize with him because he has been victimized by the system 
the way they feel they've been victimized by the system. Mm -hmm. So I I really do think that uh, the election, short of another major event that we can't predict, I think it's pretty much in the bag for Donald Trump right now. I think so. Well, Friday, Thursday and Friday of last week, the calls for Biden to step down stopped. There, there was kind of a halt to that um, because Biden has, for all intents and purposes, won the nomination of the Democratic National Committee. Um, they set that up early so that he would be the winner. They, they changed the rules a little bit. So that, that kind of stuck with him. But that doesn't mean that, that the political voting machine that we have here in America can't tilt a little um as i i believe happened last time uh but we'll have to see you know there's um th- this well, is politics we're also, yeah. what we're also seeing is that those uh, sort of politically aspiring governors like gavin newsom and gretchen whitmer and and others who are sort of hoping that they can push biden out and step in at a convention They've pulled back in the last two days because they real. I don't think they want to lose yeah. uh, if they step in and replace Biden because whoever is going to be the nominee is going to lose. Yeah. In in today's thinking, next week could be totally different. Yeah. So uh, please don't think of this program as a Trump rah rah program. I didn't vote for him for the last uh, two um elections george did we're 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 divided on him we love him we we both hate him in the same way and love him in the same way um and but this is a program that talks about things in the news and uh an attempted assassination from pennsylvania is in the news and it will be and here's the worst part about it for uh, a supporter of biden this is the news cycle for at least the next 13 or 14 days um, there's no way they're going to be able to wipe this off. And uh, the people like uh, Jan Pulaski, whatever her name is, um, uh, the Morning Joe Company, uh, all these uh, programs that have called for uh, the assassination of Donald Trump have been pulled off the program of MSNBC. And people, nobody really called for the, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, it, it's all over Twitter if you want to watch those videos of these programs saying that this man m- needs to be gotten rid of. You know, He's uh, another Hitler. He's another Hitler. He's another. Yeah, what do you think caused this little boy from Pennsylvania to pick his gun up? Social media. They were able to break into his phone yesterday. Um, I don't know if they're going to tell you what was in it. Because it's going to be such an indictment for TikTok and YouTube and uh, Facebook and uh, other platforms where uh, he was just he, uh, fed the hate and the vitriol uh, of one political party, which dominates the, the news here in America and in England. So, ah, George, let's, what, uh, we're 22 minutes in. we got to find a different topic here. Hold on. What do you got here? General Synod. Oh, I don't General want to talk Synod. about that. <laughs> I don't want to talk about them. All right. So last week, General Synod met, and uh, they uh, finally passed LLF. And uh, let's let me read out loud some of the notes you sent me. Uh, three main before, take three main takeaways. Yeah. Uh, th- are you know first of all, before they voted for this, they discovered weekly attendance is down fourteen to forty percent across all dioceses. One third of all givers who gave ten years ago are gone. Number of clergy in training is down 40%. Let's make it harder, George. Let's vote in living, love, and faith, which has other acronym definitions as well. Yeah, they had a, an honest report on the statistics facing the Church of England, and it is very poor indeed. Dire. Now, the church commissioners Dire. sit on the church Dire. commissioners yeah. sit on a, a pile of money. Yeah. I'm sorry? I, I, I was trying to interrupt you, and it, it failed greatly. I, and my audience is annoyed with me right now. I said dire. It's a dire prediction for the future of the church. Yes. Oh, I, I thought my microphone had gone out again. No, no, no. Um, dire. <laughs> the church commissioner sat on a pile of money, and that pile of money is very, very big. But the diocesan income, uh, which basically is the parish share, that is what's down 14 to 40 percent and the majority i think the majority of dioceses are now running at deficits so that and fewer clergy coming through the system means 
you know, right now we read about rural clergy with seven, eight, nine churches to care for. That might become the norm if we're getting only uh, 60% of what we hope for. Uh, then we had Martin Seeley, the Bishop of St. Edmundsbury in Ipswich, give a report on trust in the church that had been prepared by a business school professor from the University of Bristol. And trust is at a low ebb. And it is not one thing, it's many things. It's racism, it's the LLF process, it's uh, the party spirit that is dividing the church. And, but in particular, it is the failure of leadership from the establishment. Uh, people don't, you know, it, it's a very, very poor situation. And walking into to then, so from that, we walk into the LLF process and it passed by the skin of its teeth. Uh, bishops uh, 22 to 12, clergy 99 to 88, laity 95 to 91, which means that if two lay members had switched their votes, it would have failed because it had to pass in all three. And then some of the backroom stuff was revealed and it's not pretty. It was, uh, the, the final LLF proposal came out of meetings that were held in May in Leicester, uh, organized by the Church of England. Now these groups have said their work was not shared with Synod. And the people at Synod say, well, can we get a copy of what these groups prepared that you?" so that we can see the difference between what they suggested and what was given to us? And the answer was, no, you don't need it. Then the question was, well, legal advice given to the bishops has been, if you introduce these standalone blessings of same-sex, same-sex standalone blessings, will that change the doctrine of the Church of England? And the legal advice is rumored to be, yes, it will. So if you do this, you need a two-thirds majority in both, you know, over time and whatnot. So you're changing the doctrine of the Church of England. And the those, so the members of Synod say, can we see this legal advice? Because it seems to be proceeding contrary to what the lawyers tell us. The answer was, no, you don't need to see it. Then uh, the, the House of Bishops has made a great show of transparency recently. We will give you minutes of our meetings. Well, the question was, can we see minutes of meetings where you discuss this? No, you don't need to see it. You can get meetings when we discuss mosquito nets and, uh, you know, religious persecution in Nigeria, but not the real stuff. And this all comes back then to the trust issue, the trust issue that uh, Martin Seeley, Bishop of St. Edmundsbury and Itzwich raised. The bishops and the process, maybe not be all the bishops, but the institution, the mob, the blob, cannot be trusted to be transparent or fair or clear. And it basically pushed through something <clears throat> through institutional mechanisms and means that very well, that very well may spell the long-term collapse of the Church of England. Yeah, I mean, we saw last week when the government changed from conservative to labor that people who were conservative in name only were not worthy to vote for. Here we have Christians in name only uh, running the church, are they worthy to run the church? And what happens if they're in charge of the church? And I think we're going to uh, uh, find, you know, evident right now is the decline and dire circumstance of that church, but can it last another 10 or 15 years? And I, I'm not going to limit this just to politics and church. Their football team was a, a football in name only. You know, they, they lost to Spain. So, um, England has had a bad couple weeks, and um, th this is not making it any better, George. Yeah, and well, last Friday at All Souls Langham Place, the Alliance, which is the evangelical faction, uh, basically the coalition of evangelical groups, uh, held a commissioning service for 20 ministers, and of these 20, seven were bishops, one an active bishop, Rob Monroe, the Bishop of Ebb's Fleet, the Evangelical Flying Bishop. The rest were retired bishops, including Mike Hill, the Bishop of Bristol, uh, Henry Scriven, former Bishop of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. a retired Church of England assisting Bishop of Europe. And they were commissioned in a ceremony that was written, I understand, by Pete Broadbent, one of the bishops, the former Bishop of Willesden, to provide uh, informal pastoral oversight. 
Now, Pete Broadbent has said that he, you know, the, the liturgy they wrote, he made absolutely sure it did not cross any red lines um, in the uh, Church of England canon, so you can't be nailed for, for having participated in this liturgy. Um, but they're going to, but they're encouraging parishes to divert their money from the diocesan coffers to independent trusts to support uh, evangelical and Catholic causes. Because in the Church of England, you don't have to give your money. It's to the par to the diocese, you know, unlike the United States where you have to. Now, the question is, is this too little, too late? Um, I remember in 1999, uh, I hate to say this, but Kevin, you and I have been around long enough that we remember this stuff going back 25 years, 24 years, 25 years. 1999, the Reform Council basically had this public debate. Mm -hmm. Do we set up our own bishops to provide, or overseers to provide alternative Episcopal oversight and pastoral support? And the answer was, yes, we would, but we're not going to do confirmations or ordinations. This new group is not going to be doing confirmations and ordinations. So basically, we have moved absolutely nowhere since 1999. We, have, we just have a new generation of people talking about it. Let's just go back in time. This is like reporting the Rebel Alliance is taking on the Empire. But they're not going to use lightsabers. They're not going to use uh, Jedis. <laughs> you have Jedis who have agreed not to use their, their ultimate power. And... You know, I, I see failure in this, or at least it's going to take many uh, episodes for this to work its way out. In Star Wars, it took three ep uh, movie sanctions to, to work its way out. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think you want to, in a time of spiritual battle, handicap yourself and say that we're not going to do confirmations and baptisms. Uh, I don't see the long-term gain in that because you're taking away the only ceremonial things that the, the Church of England is capable of doing and bringing it into your own realm uh, of we're, we're walking away from the bad and keeping the good. The power of groups like the uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, mm -hmm. as, as uh, Arch Archbishop Lefebvre's groups, whatnot, was that they were able because to validly ordain their own clergy mm -hmm. and perform rites because of the validity of the the bishop's orders so any any clergyman ordained by these bishops would be uh, valid but irregularly ordained but they still be a clergy so what i'm trying to say is the only thing that will make the church of england establishment take up sit up and take notice is if they start doing confirmations start with confirmations remove the bishop's role entirely if you're not giving money and you don't need a bishop to show up for confirmations you're still in the diocese and all this and that because unlike america the church commissioners own all the property and so if you say you're out you're out the doors get the doors get locked on you the next day yeah. but allow this parallel province to form within the Church of England by giving it sacramental authority. Um, now, confirmation and, bapt and ordination are not part of the two sacraments, they already are baptism and Eucharist, but yeah. the, give them the things that the bishops are frightened of losing. See, we're in a place right now where the power of bishops in the Church of England is non-negotiable, but doctrine is negotiable. And I think it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. <laughs> oh, brother. All right, let's move on to another news story. Uh, now, if you can't tell, uh, I'm in a campground, and there's a highway back there where all the cars are going, and uh, George and I got to see a dump truck go by in the pre-show, and uh, it just it's life in a campground. We have relocated from uh, outside of Yellowstone, Wyoming, into uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. For those of you who've been watching the program a long time, you remember we broke down last year in Rapid City for seven weeks. So uh, we're hoping to escape here this afternoon after the show and go on to Sioux Falls. Uh, and then uh, I'll be visiting my dad's gravesite uh, tomorrow. 
which would be kind of cool. And then going on to Madison for a couple of days where this old fellow you're looking at here on screen, all the wrinkles, I'm going to go to my 40th class reunion, fat and bald. Hopefully all the other guys there are, are the same. Let's move on to some uh, news. Jonathan Fletcher has been indicted uh, in a court in England. Eight counts of indecent insult and one count of grievous, grievous bodily harm. Um, the alleged offenses took place between 1973 and 1999. Why are we taking an 80-year-old to court? Why did it take so long, George? <sighs> this is this and the uh, Smythe case are the two poison arrows in the evangelical establishment's side. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say there was a cover-up because we don't have all the facts, but Fletcher was protected uh, for years. He was the uh, incumbent at uh, Emmanuel Church in Wimbledon, and he was extraordinarily influential in the in the evangelical movement. And there have been, you know, you and I, Kevin, have reported on what people told us about the things that he would do, and we've shared, you know, these reports. Now, the problem is the Diocese of Southwark can't really talk out loud now because it's an active legal case. And in England, they're pretty strict. You can't, it's not like the OJ case where <laughs> in the United States, where as it's going on, you can say anything you want. It doesn't matter. Elton uh, John can England, have marital problems and they would never hear about it. We get to talk about it over here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, we're not going to influence a jury in England, no. but uh, we're not going to, uh, we don't need the grief if, if, to, that would come from this yeah. but Fletcher is accused of major crimes Gro gross uh, grievously bodily harm is a, uh, could be rape uh, could be sexual assault um, his victims were young men allegedly uh, who uh, this is this is sort of the pervert bookend to Bishop Ball the Anglo-Catholic Bishop who molested young men who were exploring the monastic life for the anglo-catholic religious vocations and he would sexually abuse them and this is the evangelical equivalent and i hate to say it but uh, uh the conduct of leading evangelicals in sort of knowing but doing no action has caused great discredit just discredit mm -hmm. to the old leadership of that movement uh, we always arrive at the same position, don't we? It happened with uh, Spong. He can do what he wants to do. It doesn't interfere with the College of Bishops over here. It, you know, with uh, Jimmy Swaggart, he can do what he wants to do. It doesn't interfere with the the, the um, what, uh, Assembly of God uh, narrative over here. And when you don't hold people accountable, um, this is a black eye that you're going to deal with not for hours or days or years this is going to be a black eye to the church for decades and it's not a black well, eye of one man it's a black eye in, in horror of all the victims yeah when i gra was graduating from college uh in the mid 80s um i talked to my home record i, I was in college up north i but my parish was in florida and i talked to my rector there should i uh you know should I start the process in Florida or Pennsylvania or New York or wherever? And he said, I, and he said, he came out of the diocese in New York. He know, knew the Bishop Paul Moore. And the last thing in the world he wanted me to do was to anywhere go near Paul Moore. And I said, why? He said, well, just trust me. You don't want to do it. Well, why do I mention this? Paul Moore, very famous Bishop of New York, <clears throat> turned out to be a Jonathan Fletcher type. Mm -hmm and Moore is now dead and now his daughter his daughter wrote about wrote about bi uh, a biography talking about her father's sexual peccadilloes and everybody it seemed knew about this in the 80s and in the early 90s while he was still bishop but nobody said anything because paul moore was one of the giants of the episcopal church he had won the i think he won the navy cross or the silver star at guadalcanal as a marine lieutenant and had been a slum priest and had, you know he was just the sort of thing that you know your uh the episcopal church just loved to put out there as an example of the great 
you know, clergy we have, a war hero, an intellectual, a, a worker who cared for the poor, but also a pervert. And people knew this, but they never said anything until yeah. he died. I mean, Paul wanted to be sure that when we put people in charge of other people, that they were above reproach. And um, you, you fail that. The Apostle Paul, not Bishop Paul. Or, Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Apostle Paul, number two, <laughs> uh, said that it's so important when you put somebody in charge of other people that they be above reproach because this is not a um, one and done. This is a haunting legacy. And it's sad to read about Smythe this way. It's horrible to read about Fletcher this way. And it, to me, my heart breaks when we're convicting an 80-year-old and not when he, he was 45 and doing this. You know, we could have put a stop to this pain a long time ago, corrected it, and uh, dealt with the victims then. Now the victims are finally getting justice, and they're 60 years old. And... Um, that's just not right. Let's move on to some news. Church in Hong Kong not standing still. The CCP, who we've recently talked about with the Global South, has another meeting with had another meeting with Protestants. Leaders saying sermons must meet the approval of the Communist Party. <sighs> not yet enforced in Hong Kong, but certainly enforced in China. I mean, uh, this this is one of those wishy washy topics because. Church is not just the sermon on Sunday. You can operate a very functional church underground with still letting the CCP uh, uh, look over your, your sermons. Uh, however, that's just, that's just one little start. You give them the sermon, they're going to want something else. We want to be able to prove your prayers. We want to be able to prove your healing ministry. We want to be able to approve your Eucharist. So, I mean, yeah... This is annoying and can be over, you know, can be gotten away with, but it's one step, George. It's the wrong step. We're taking up the Hong Kong story again, uh, which we covered last. I think it was last show. Um, uh, yeah. Because the CCP Central Committee is doubling down <laughs> on the Protestant uh, on all religions, and so there, there's going to be someone record. If you don't, you know, your sermon will be listened to by the state, whether there's a camera in the church or mosque or temple recording whatever you say, or whether there's somebody with the steno pad writing it down, you are going to be listened to, and your sermon must conform to Chairman Xi's thought and policies. Now, this isn't in Hong Kong yet, but may just be a matter of time. And one of our viewers from Hong Kong said, you, you don't write off Hong Kong yet, that the Chinese approach and the leadership of the Anglican Church in Hong Kong is not directly confrontational. They realize that if they stand in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, like that famous picture from 89, I think it was, they're going to get run over. Mm -hmm. So they are quite, they had a conference on evangelism, 150 Chinese clergy, plus a few of the English speaking ones met. And the focus of the Anglican Church in Hong Kong is individual, personal evangelism, bringing the faith of Jesus Christ to people. Now they can't do much really effectively. You can't fight the state in China. It's like Stalin's Russia, you know, you just are not gonna win. But the church is focusing on healing ministries of uh, evangelical ministries, outreach ministries. And here's the exciting part. Uh, it was announced that the Hong Kong church is now uh, partnering with the Diocese of Singapore to do mission work in Thailand. Now, Singapore is a very, it's charismatic diocese. It's a very alive, powerful Chinese, mostly diocese. And the Hong Kong church has, in the past had kept its distance, but now they're getting closer. And some of our contacts in Singapore are saying is that, you know, the reason why they're sort of soft peddling the China problem is that they want to create personal relationships and networks because, you know, it's easy for George and Florida con to condemn false teaching from the Chinese establishment, but they want to be able to reach out 
and be effective with pastors and people on the ground, given that uh, regimes change and empires change, and but Christ is there forever. So I th they're slowly bringing Hong Kong into the global South fold, just as they brought the three self, self patriotic movement with the party's approval to the Cairo meeting. Yes, there's danger there, but at the same time, if you're not going to talk and sort of welcome them, you're going to close them off from the advantages of the living dynamic faith that you find in the Anglican world. It's an age old question. Do we become isolationists? Do we want to go in there and, and, uh, have some say in the nation? Um, it's difficult. What, you know, what do we do as Christians, uh, to have our church affected on a political realm, uh, Apple and major corporations are in China right now, but they had to give up rights to do so. Tim Cook had, if you own a iPhone in China, the government has your name, contact information, and the list of apps on your phone. You have a very uh, limited access to what apps you can have. You can't have WhatsApp on your phone uh, in, in China. You can have Facebook because they made an agreement uh, with China. You can uh, you can't have X because X broke that their agreement. Um, but to get into communist, evil, non-democratic uh, company uh, countries, sometimes you have to make uh, some uh, uh, hard agreements. And deals with the devil, they're de called. Deals with the devil, they're called. Uh, in the past, globally, getting in has helped politically. I don't know if you want to do the same with the church, to compromise the church. I don't know. This, above my pay grade, you know, a, a million percent. Well, we're not at a North Korea level. You know, when the North Koreans killed all the Anglican clergy, yeah. uh, all the native Anglican clergy, and the foreign missionaries they imprisoned uh, and eventually expelled or murdered. And today it is a virtual death sentence that you, uh, three generations of your family will be rounded up if you're found to be a practicing Christian. Mm -hmm. We're not like that in China. Uh, you're still allowed to be a Christian, but it's a controlled sort of Christian. So the response to that is different from the response in North Korea it's different from the response in a place like Iran, uh, where last week's uh, show with Father Argo, which I encourage people to watch, it's really encouraging mm -hmm. to hear about God's moving across the Middle East. Um, different res different places take different responses, as you know the response in the United States. I'm under no persecution whatsoever, uh, and but in fact, you know, as a as a minister, as a priest in Florida. My life is much, much better than it is, say, in Seattle or in Connecticut yeah. uh, because of the of the local culture. I still live in Christendom, believe it or not, mm -hmm. um, where there's a deference to the clergy that disappeared a generation ago in some parts of the United States. No, you're, I mean, we've discussed it before. Christianity in America has lost the benefit of the doubt. I would say for the West, uh, you know, what it meant to be a Christian... Uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago, that um, personata of Christianity has been wiped out. We don't have that um, ability to have that influence anymore. I'm a Christian. I'm not, sometimes I'm despised, but I'm never trusted. I'm never trusted because of the Jonathan Fletchers, the uh, Jimmy Swaggerts, the, the people who've come before me who've ruined what it means to be a Christian. And so, you know, but but it it's not universal. Like you know, taking it back to my op the comments I made at the beginning of the show. I'm in a country barbecue place on Saturday night after church, dressed like this. Mm -hmm. um, none of my congregation is there yet. Perfect strangers come up to me and ask me, "Is God involved?" Sure. They don't know if I'm Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox or whatever. Or they don't know what I am. But there's an automatic deference to the clergy that we don't have in California, for instance. Right. Um, no. People don't care what the clergy have to say. Indeed. All right, so we're running up here on uh, four, 49 minutes, and we got 22 topics to go. Um, what, what, what can we pare down here? 
Uh, you want? We can do, skip Texas. Let's skip Texas. Let's. Uh, you want to talk about? We already kind of talked about the labor government a little bit, but we need to talk about this because it affects the church that uh, currently doesn't care. Fears the new labor government in uh, Britain, England mostly, uh, will push through conversion therapy ban and crit, uh, criminalize prayer, which they already did for uh, buffer zones around uh, abortion clinics, George. What's going on? Well, that was the conservative government of all yeah, people. No kidding. <laughs> you know, criminalized a silent prayer about abortion clinics. Mm -hmm. Now there's a push by the new government to criminalize conversion prayer uh, so that there are certain prayers that will land you in jail if they seek to uh, help someone with their sexual identity. Um, the uh, coalition of religious groups and clergy signed an open letter to the government last week, which we published on Anglican Inc. saying, please don't criminalize prayer. However, there are some zealots, both on the gay movement and in the Church of England, who are cheering. Uh, Jan Jan Jane Ozan uh, has been tweeting, you know, her joy at the labor victory and her buddies in the new government. They're going to make sure that these troglodytes who, who want to help people uh, deal with uh, sexual uh, dysphoria, with their trans issues, with homosexuality. They will be punished by the full weight of the law if they pray for people. And we haven't seen it put into uh, legislation yet, but it's one of the things that the new labor government is keen to do. Interesting, because here in America, we are run by progressives. Uh, they demand abortion till birth. They uh, demand uh, that parents have no rights over their children's sexual identity or gender. Uh, and, you know, in, in many states, that's the law now. Uh, we are very progressive in certain respects here in America. In England, not so much. In England, most abortions are restricted to England. In Europe, most abortions are restricted to 15 or 16 weeks. Um, that's not American progressiveness. And in Europe, they're slowly stopping uh, the introduction of hormones to kids who have gender dysphoria, uh, all based on the uh, CAS report. Yet, the Church of England and the, the new uh, liberal government of England are trying to go the way of America, George. Hard to watch. Well, I think... I think if Trump is elected, the new the, the labor government is going to have some interesting times. The foreign secretary has been on the record calling Trump a Nazi and uh, a monster. And, mm -hmm. and J.D. Vance, the newly anointed vice presidential candidate for Donald Trump, spoke the National Conservative Conference in Washington last week. And one of the things he said is the uh, first Muslim nation uh, to get the nuclear bomb will probably be Britain under the labor government. Now... He was being sarcastic. He was making a joke, and some people in England are, are horrified, but that, that he would be so Islamophobic and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is no love lost between uh, the Trump and the what we call the MAGA Republicans and the uh, labor movement. Labor, not the labor movement. They had the president of the Teamsters, and it's the first time since Ronald Reagan, I think the Teamsters are back in a Republican. Yeah. yeah. You talk about un, you know, unusual times, the Teamsters, yeah. the, who are the truck truck driver union, mm -hmm. major union in the United States, are back in the Republicans. So somebody sent me a link that said Justin Welby is now going to say that biology is old-fashioned. Yep. The uh, Justin Welby and the Church of England uh, schools They've put out guidance on Christ on for their schools how to te deal with the issue of gender, and these guidance still rely upon Stonewall and various gay and trans organizations. So they use the term cisgender, which is you know one of these things I have to look up. I had to look up gaslighting. Kevin helped uh, <laughs> a little help bit. With it. <laughs> Kevin, now what does cisgender mean? I'm not. I still don't have my head around that. Well, it doesn't mean white man, but because you are the gender of the biological sex you were born with, you identify as a man and your uh, um, uh, genitals are male, you are cisgendered. I happen to be cisgendered, 
most people uh, like uh, it, this is outside of the, the, the identity politics 99.99997 percent of people are cisgendered now that we've introduced uh, gender politics and identity politics uh, they claim that only 70 percent of people are cisgendered uh, but boy do you have to do <laughs> some weird math to get there um, cisgendered is you are normal George there, there you go Okay, I th I thought it meant you were a sissy or something. No, 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 cisgendered. You are normal. You are the way God intended you. So the Church of England is using the term cisgender now, mm -hmm. as school system, and mm -hmm. they're using the phrase the sex you're assigned it at birth. So you're not born a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. You're assigned the category boy mm -hmm. or girl uh -huh. when you're born. Do you want a salad or do you want fries? I mean, yeah. yeah. So. So chromosomes and you know, x y double x all that stuff that's out the board it's now fantasy mm -hmm. um you know the people who trust told us to trust the science now tell us to ignore the science because we're on a different topic we've moved from climate to biology trust climate science which is all models and is not science it's projection, no. it projection. but reject reject biological science because that's uh that is heteronormative or whatever phrase it is so you know i would think i don't know if this is actually true but it seems to me that the walt disney corporation has somehow acquired the church of england because the way disney has gone over the past generation the church of england is going too, mm -hmm. such that you know now star wars has got its latest episodes that involve lesbians and transgender people and there are no white male characters in star wars and, and church you know of what, england is going down that path and you know what else there's no longer in star wars profit nobody's watching these things anymore nobody wants to see uh the made up uh characters that are beyond fiction that are being forced upon you and this is being forced because at a certain point you can be a heretic uh in christianity without too much trouble as justin welby is uh, demonstrated very well but at another point you go from heretic to being a monster when you're taking uh, kids and confusing them about who they are and who God intended them to be you become a monster uh, God has intention for your life and it is not for you to slice off your genitals and try to become a gender you are not that is Satan at his greatest you know, I used to, we used to joke, hey, you know, <clears throat> Satan's job is to prove that he doesn't exist. No, his greatest work now is to prove that you don't belong to the, the sex you were assigned. And uh, to, to get you to cut off your genitals. That's, that's Satan in its greatest. In my small, yeah, we used opinion. We used, to, yeah. We used yeah. to joke about some of these castration cults like the, the hail bop Comet people yep. who all committed suicide. And, <laughs> yeah. Huh. You know, uh, liberal religion these days is going down that path into a castration cult of uh, destroying uh, God's purposes for sexuality in some very anti-human, anti-God way. Okay. Two minutes. We can do it. Gaza Hospital. Gaza Hospital uh, was protecting, not on their own desire, but uh, terrorists were hidden under the Gaza, Gaza hospital in Gaza. And uh, lo and behold, uh, everybody in liberal Christendom starts tweeting that uh, Israel needs to stop and be embarrassed because they had to close Gaza, Gaza hospital because Israel said they're going to bomb it. Not so, George. Give me a no. quick, quick update. <laughs> Diocese Jerusalem issued a statement saying the Israeli government had, had ordered the uh, I'll, uh, the, the, their Anglican hospital in Gaza to close. Uh -huh. Well, the AP did a story saying they talked to the director of the hospital. He said, no, we weren't ordered to close. Israel just issued a warning for the neighborhoods around the hospital saying, we're going to come and now clean out Hamas from these areas. And then the uh, Times of Israel talked to Israeli army spokesman said, no, we haven't told anybody to do anything except get out. We didn't close the hospital. Well, how did these tweets happen? 
How did Justin Welby, uh, Michael Curry, and all these people get around and start tweeting that uh, Israel ordered the closure, George? I don't get this. Because the Diocese of Jerusalem, which is in Jerusalem, not in Gaza, uh -huh. put out a hysterical statement. Uh -huh. Now, the Diocese of Jerusalem is famous for this. And you know, I've been covering these areas for a long time. I remember when Bishop Rhea put out these statements about the Janine massacre or the, uh, uh -huh. the Aldura incident where the Israeli army deliberately shot and killed a boy. And uh, the French TV made a whole documentary about it. And it all turned out to be a lie that it was kid was killed by the Palestinian bullet, not an Israeli one. Mm -hmm. But of course, any attempt to blacken Israel, the Anglican diocese under Rhea did. Now we had a bit of a pause. And now with the new bishop, we've gone back to the bad old days of mm -hmm. Israel deliberately targeted with missiles, the hospital. No. That wasn't true. It wasn't friendly a missile fire. strike. It was it was a friendly fire, yeah. anti missiles, and you know whatever it was. The the Hamas rockets fell to the earth on the hospital parking lot. Um, Hamas uh, has been using hospitals. It's been using the UN offices in Gaza as command and control centers underneath because they figured the Israel is not going to bomb uh, a hospital or a UN building. Uh, with innocence on the ground floor while we're below doing our evil things. And so Israel's response has been, okay, we're not going to bomb you and wipe you out. We're just going to steamroller you. And we ask the people to get out of the way while we take care of Gaza. And today it was announced the hospital's back open again. Uh, the patients had been transferred to the uh, Indonesian-run hospital in <clears throat> North Gaza. <clears throat> now they're back in again. But... I've been doing this long enough that there's certain people that I need to have confirmation from independent parties before I write anything they say. And unfortunately, the Diocese of Jerusalem is one of them. And Justin Welby and Michael Curry. I, with the list goes on, people, we need to have to double check the accuracy of their reporting. It's sad. Very sad. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 870 of Anglican unscripted.